It's often called the lungs of the earth, and for many weeks now, the Amazon rainforest has been on fire. Its destruction would be devastating to us all, but when the international community offered to help, Brazil was quick to remind everyone that it has jurisdiction. Such events point to a difficult question that could arise much more frequently in the future. Is state sovereignty an outdated concept in a world facing what many call a climate change emergency? With us to consider that in Madrid, Spain, via Skype, Teresa Cramars, co-director of the Environmental Governance Lab at U of T's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. In the nation's capital, Alan Rock, formerly Canada's ambassador to the United Nations and a cabinet minister in Jean Chrétien's government, now professor of law at the University of Ottawa. And Gary Keller, vice president of Strategy Corp, formerly chief of staff to John Baird, minister of foreign affairs in the Stephen Harper government. And in Waterloo, Ontario, Simon Dalby, senior fellow at CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation and professor of geography and environmental studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. And it's a delight to welcome everybody to our airwaves tonight here on TVO. I want to start actually by quoting something Alan Rock wrote in the Globe and Mail with his former cabinet colleague Lloyd Axworthy, Canada's former foreign affairs minister. And it goes like this. In the Amazon, more than just Brazil's sovereign interest is at stake. Brazil is the trustee of a critical global asset. If the government of Brazil puts that asset at grave risk, thereby endangering the lives of others around the world, then the international community must act in the name of humanity. Alan Rock, let's get you started here. Uh, why do you believe the Amazon fire requires international intervention regardless of Brazil's personal sovereign interests here? Well, the, the world has long since acknowledged that sovereignty is not absolute. That is to say that uh, you cannot simply close your borders and do whatever you want within them. Uh, Fifteen years ago, the General Assembly unanimously agreed on the principle that if a country is slaughtering its own people or standing by while others do so within its own borders, the international community has an obligation to do something about it. That put an asterisk on sovereignty for the first time. I think this is another example of the need for such an asterisk. That is to say, there's now a global consensus that climate change is an existential threat to the world. Everybody has to do their part around the world to meet that challenge. And if one country puts a global asset like the rainforest at risk, which could have a meaningful impact on our collective effort to save the globe, then the international community must respond, not necessarily with troops. As in the case of mass atrocities, you start with economic sanctions, with measures that will bring pressure to bear upon the government. And intervention is only the last resort. But the principle is the same, it seems to me, where there's a globally acknowledged goal, an expectation that each individual country will do its part, and an outlier, a rogue state refusing, endangering the achievement of the overall goal, the international community has the right and indeed the obligation to do something about it. Okay, that's the thesis. Let's get some feedback from others on that. Let me ask, uh, first of all, your conservative friend sitting beside you. Gary, what do you think of this view? Well, look, I, I appreciate the uh, viewpoint that Mr. Rock has brought forward, and, and I'm sure he brings it forward in, in a, a spirit of uh, goodwill and good meaning, but I kind of feel like it's a little bit of clickbait for the commentary pages. Uh, you know, we've seen the responsibility to protect doctrine be adopted by the UN, but in recent times, uh, and I'm trying to fit this within to the environmental lens, uh, the, the whole issue of responsibility to protect hasn't been so successful. Uh, uh, it has, we've tried it in Libya, and that has not been a huge uh, success in the outcome uh, in Libya. And we haven't been able to enact it in other places in uh, the Syrian civil war, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's the plight of the Rohingya population in Burma. Look, uh, the, uh, the, the Brazilian government has faced a lot of pressure. Uh, Canada has uh, offered $15 million in aid and firefighting equipment, and that appears to have been accepted by the Bolsonaro government. Uh, the Chilean government has uh, offered some aid, and the Israelis are sending firefighters. What has actually happened with the news story uh, after uh, Bolsonaro rejected the first uh, proposal of aid is that he's been feeling pressure on his own uh, population, and he is starting to accept 
uh, aid. So I, I think uh, using the pressure of the multilateral system and the bilateral system to uh, encourage him to accept assistance uh, has started to help. He's even put in a, a, a freeze on uh, starting any new fires, which is which is a start. It's a step in the right direction. And uh, it's not just in Brazil where there are issues. Uh, Bolivia next door, Evo Morales, has encouraged uh, clearing land by uh, by fire. So um, I think it's a, a, a bit of a step too far, and I think we should try to use the multilateral and the bilateral systems that we have around the world uh, in situations like this. Let me pick up on that with Teresa. Teresa, do you think there are risks uh, a local populist backlash in Brazil if the international community were to intervene against Brazil's wishes? Yeah, I think that the, 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 the big concern here is that we are banking on a system, on a policy that is uh, predicated on multilateralism. And multilateralism, I, both of my colleagues here are advocating one form or another of multilateralism. Multilateralism is just not working very well. Uh, as we know, I mean, it's, it's barely on life support in many environmental uh, areas. So um, I don't think it's practical. And uh, I also think that it can incite a sort of feeding into this um, uh, it, it, into this this uh, discourse from the Bolsonaro government, which is, you know, we're facing the developed nations uh, who are telling us we can't develop the way they did. There's a whole climate justice debate, and there's a whole pitting of environment versus development in the Brazilian discourse that Bolsonaro is tapping into, and I think that this, uh, this will accentuate that. So I don't think it's the right policy to a little. Simon Dalby, we just heard from Gary a moment ago that there, there is certainly international precedent when the risk of people being slaughtered by their own government is at hand. The rest of the world uh, has intervened in those circumstances. Libya was mentioned uh, as an example. Can you give us any precedent, though, for international intervention in the case of uh, environmental damage or environmental degradation, as is the case here? Well, it really comes down to what you mean by intervention. The conversation so far, we've talked about all sorts of policy things that can be understood to be intervening because there's a cross-border dimension to this. Um, clearly, we have dealt with um, fires, for instance, in Southeast Asia, the Singaporeans getting particularly upset um, some years ago uh, with fires in Indonesia, um, demanding that Indonesia do something about the smoke that was causing all sorts of breathing problems for the population in Singapore. Um, is that intervention? Um, clearly, the uh, attempts to get, along with um, uh, Malaysia, to get the Indonesians to do something um, could be seen as interference. Um, but yet, we're dealing with a situation where clearly the smoke from Indonesia was causing huge problems in Singapore. That, too, is a cross-border sort of form of intervention because, um, albeit inadvertently, Indonesia was causing all sorts of problems for Singapore. The, the problem with environmental issues is they don't follow state boundaries neatly. Um, and all sorts of uh, ways of crossing the border in terms of bilateral, trilateral agreements in that case, um, trying to get a handle on this is, is the world we now live in. Uh, what's really the problem with the Bolsoneros of this world is their reassertion of nationalist um, uh, uh, policies um, invoking sovereignty, um, invoking precisely the kind of arguments that Teresa was just mentioning. Um, but doing so in a way that is very damaging precisely because of land clearance and further deforestation being, being uh, encouraged. Um, we have to stop and think about the linkages across those borders because we are all tied together in all sorts of complicated ways. Um, but the question of, of, of sovereignty clearly um, has to be challenged when it comes to these cross-border issues. And indeed, there is a whole lot of international agreements that are premised on the assumption that harm shouldn't be done across a, a, a frontier. Uh, that goes back right or, um, back to the to sort of the founding principles of UNEP um, nearly 50 years ago now. Um, the problem is the politics of this and the invocation of sovereignty in the face of obviously global problems. Alan Rock, I wonder if you could speak to the criticism that I'm, that I'm hearing uh, from, from a couple of the guests, namely that um, I guess they give you the compliment first. You know, we understand where you're coming from. We appreciate the passion. We appreciate the, the need to do something. But, and then here comes the big but, right? But we don't want to stir up the local population. We don't want to give these tin pot dictators like Bolsonaro, as you have referred to him. We don't want to give them, uh, you know, breathe any fuel into their fire at the moment. How do you get around those arguments? 
But I don't want to turn the world over to my granddaughter in a way that she can't live in it. We have to deal with the challenge of climate change. Let me deal first with the criticism that multi multilateralism doesn't work. Well, it worked just four short years ago when there was a global consensus on the Paris Accord. Targets were established. Everybody agreed this was a problem we had to tackle together. We're going through a difficult period now with multilateralism because of the, the man who's in the White House and because of some uh, backlash against uh, refugees in Europe. It's a difficult time for multilateralism, but it doesn't mean we should give up on it. The only way we'll move forward is through multilateralism, and, and Gary acknowledged multilateral efforts are necessary. That's all I'm saying. We should act in a concerted way internationally to bring pressure on this government to stop doing something that's destructive of the entire planet. And by the way, when I use intervention, and I'm sensitive to Tom, Thomas's point, I don't talk about crossing the border with a military, I mean putting pressure on this regime, and he's already shown that pressure it can be successful. Bolsonaro is not the last person who's going to imperil the achievement of our collective goal on climate change by acting in his own interest, blind to the interest of others. So we should debate the principle now. One of the reasons Lloyd, Lloyd Axworthy and I wrote as we did in The Globe is to provoke this kind of discussion. And I've seen, whether it's in The Guardian or The New York Times or elsewhere, people are starting to express a view about this. Where does sovereignty end and our collective interest begin? Well, we've already confronted that with the Rwanda-type massacre. Now we have to confront it with climate change. And I say there ought to be a principle established that no one state or small handful of states can, in a rogue fashion, endanger the achievement of an important global goal, like saving the climate, saving the planet from climate change, without our responding in a coherent, collective way uh, to influence them to stop. I think that's an important principle. You certainly is have. Is that going to apply to us? Yeah, t please uh, come on in, Teresa. No, I'm just saying, is that going to apply to us as well? Are we not going to exploit our tar sands for the same principle? Alan Rock, you want to come back on that? I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear that, Steve. Would you tell me what, what Theresa said? Sure. She's suggesting that uh, whether we should have to follow the same principle as it relates to the, she called them tar sands, most people call them the oil sands in Western Canada. Absolutely. These rules apply to everybody. But, you know, the, the companies who are enga engaged in the oil sands development in Alberta are taking making efforts in good faith to minimize the impact of those operations. There are controls on the way the, the oil is refined, the way it's used in the, uh, internal combustion engines. There are controls all along the way. And uh, we accede to those controls and we respect them. So, but this, the, the regime in Brazil is encouraging the wanton destruction by fire of the Amazon and then, at least for a while, was doing nothing to stop those fires and doing it in the name of economic development. That's quite a different situation. And as for the argument of colonialism, I say that that argument is bogus. If we have an obligation to Brazil in today's global economy, it may be to provide assistance in their economic development, but it's not to stand by and have them do what they're doing on the argument that, well, the developed countries did this for centuries, now we have the right to do it as well. That's, that's bogus logic, it doesn't work. You cannot justify an act of such global damage by citing the misconduct of developed country, countries in the past. It's a different world now. We're a small number of degrees Celsius away from an uninhabitable planet. And if we have an obligation to help them with their economic development, so be it. But not to stand by while they do this in the name of economic development. Teresa, I'm inferring from your question that you think if we ought to be allowed to unilaterally send, for example, water bombers down to Brazil, we have to be prepared for the fact that some other country may want to take direct action against our pipelines in Western Canada, for example. Have I got that right? So, well, let me, let me qualify that I'm not a defender of sovereignty. Uh, I don't see the primacy of sovereignty in the international system as something sanctimonious that we should all be defending. I, I think that we have the wrong architecture to deal with the kind of environmental and health and security issues that we're facing. I work in environmental politics, and I see it very clearly. Um, and uh, so, so I, would not, uh, I would not ever say that we have to just respect 
the principle of sovereignty. We have to be nuanced and understand, as uh, Simon is saying, when it's invoked and for what reasons and work with that in a practical way. Um, I think that uh, wanting multilateralism is different from having multilateralism. Um, so although I think it's it's great if we could have more multilateralism, the reality of the day is that we have multi-stakeholder partnerships, we have voluntary uh, standard setting, we have a lot of private sector action in the environmental sector, and those are the actors that are actually acting. So um, I'm just cautioning what it is that we want versus what it is that we can get right now. Understood. Let me follow up with Simon on this. And, and one of the criticisms that I've heard, Simon, and I'll ask our director to put up a graph uh, to that end, and for those who are listening on podcast, I'll just describe it, because many people have pointed out that um, the fire situation in Brazil, we see, if you look to the very right-hand part of the graph here, that's where we're at right now. But if you go back, uh, you know, almost 20 years, maybe 15 years, there were actually more fires, and they were worse in the 2000s. So the question then becomes, Simon, what makes now different? We didn't take direct intervention 15 years ago. Why would, be, why would we be entitled to do so today? Well, I think the history is even longer than that. Um, if you go back to the 1980s is when this first really um, hit the international agenda. Um, people may remember the assassination of Chico Mendes in 1988 as one of the people in Brazil who was struggling to prevent the deforestation and he got killed for his trouble. Um, if you fast forward to the episode you're talking about about 15 years ago, um, uh, there was a whole lot of international pressure brought to bear on Brazil um, uh, because after all, the initial response back in the 80s, Brazil cleaned up its act in terms of deforestation because it was hosting the Earth Summit, uh, 1992. If you remember that back that far, some of our listeners and watchers will. Um, uh, that was the, the moment at which the world community came together and, and drafted the Framework Convention on Climate Change, as well as the Framework Convention on Biodiversity. Um, Brazil had to basically clean up its act back then um, to legitimately host that, uh, that huge conference. Fast forward into the episode 15 years ago or so, and yes, once again, um, burning of the forests was getting international attention, um, and uh, it, pressure was brought to bear um, to get the Brazilians to back off on their use of fire as a land clearing um, uh, technique. Uh, now we're back, is this the third time round? Um, uh, once again, this uh, goes to the point we made a few minutes ago, that there's an internal politics and in Brazil, arguments about what kind of economic development um, are appropriate, and Bolsonaro's argument was basically, you know, go deforest and grow things and don't worry about it. But there's a couple of large ironies in the Brazilian case too. Um, part of it is, of course, that uh, part of the clearing in the past, I'm not sure about the recent um, situation, but part of the clearing in the past was, was to grow um, corn for ethanol production on the grounds that this was in fact a green fuel and was hence helping uh, with climate change. Uh, I think the, the point Alan Rock made a, a few minutes ago is, is important if we in the international community are going to help with economic development there um, across sovereign boundaries, we do need to think about what kind of economic ties we actually have with Brazil. Um, and indeed, there was, of course, efforts in previous episodes to, uh, by states around the world to ban the import of Brazilian beef on the argument that the deforestation was being done to turn the forest into grasslands, to um, uh, raise cattle, which would then feed the hamburger chains of the world. Um, so intervening in, is that the right word? Um, having policy mm -hmm. that deals with, uh, deals with what kinds of economic activity one is supporting uh, in, in other parts of the world is part of the international toolkit on this. Um, and, you know, there was, there's been debates about extractive reserves back in the 80s. Are the ways to support the Brazilian economy growing um, nuts rather than um, cows? because nuts can be grown in a forest, whereas cows need grassland, which requires removing the forest. Those kinds of debates have been going on for a long time. But I think uh, to Alan's point, we really do need to ramp them up now 
and think much more clearly about what international economic measures are in place to support the production of things that are made in ecologically relatively friendly ways at least um, and make sure that uh, we are sending economic signals that don't encourage uh, farmers or for that matter, and this is an important point, larger multinational um, agricultural corporations to uh, wholesale uh, deforest uh, to make uh, a quick uh, profits on, on, on export crops. Those are the kinds of international measures. They don't generate the kind of headlines that the dramatic pictures of the satellite fire, satellite uh, pictures of the fires do, but they really do matter in terms of how we uh, collectively shape uh, the global economy uh, to deal with the, the climate issue. Let me now pick up on uh, the point Teresa was making a second ago, which if I can crudely sum up was we have to watch out about whether or not what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And to that end, Gary, let me get you to comment on this first. Here's uh, David Wallace Wells writing in uh, New York Magazine. He writes, Canada's Justin Trudeau was the first leader to echo French President Emmanuel Macron's call to action. But he recently approved the Trans Mountain Pipeline. In fact, every single member nation of the G7 is hiding some significant climate hypocrisy behind their pressure on Bolsonaro, however laudable that pressure is. To pretend that Bolsonaro is the world's only climate villain or the Amazon is the only region in the world currently in climate crisis is an act of grand self-delusion. Gary, are we and France and others in a glass house on this one? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think when it comes to the oil sands, and we talked about this a little bit, is that uh, I could see a group of countries uh, banding together, sometimes to protect their own self-interest and their own energy production, saying, ooh, Canada is a bad actor here. We've got to take action to do something. Uh, that, that would be a huge challenge. Uh, in the case of Bolsonaro, yes, this action has been taken. but. Uh, multilateralism seems to be working in a way in, in that the pressure is uh, requiring him to put in uh, restrictions on certain uh, certain practices. We have firefighting teams coming. And meanwhile, right across the border, nobody's saying very much about Evo Morales because he's seen as a bastion of the progressive left, but he has had the exact same policy uh, in an election campaign, encouraging people to uh, raise forests for, uh, for, for, uh, for crop growing and for, for beef ranching. And that foreigners shouldn't uh, intervene. Uh, we talked a little bit about the colonialist argument, and I actually think, especially dealing with Latin America, that is a real risk here. Brazil is a large country. It's a developing country. And uh, any action that is seen as being a, an action of the colonial West or the G7, it would be very easy for the Bolsonaro government and others to say, this is just you know, the United States and others uh, in the West uh, trying to impose a colonial agenda. And then when we talk about uh, you know, bad actors around the world, uh, it's, it, you know, China and India are leading contributors to greenhouse gas and pollution. Yet at the same time, when you raise the issues with them, they they say very clearly, look, the West has had hundreds of years of economic development to grow the, their, their economies and to lift their people out of poverty. What we're trying to do is simply the same thing. We're trying to raise our population's uh, uh, living standards to the same kind of living standards that you have, or even at half the, the level that you have. How, how dare you tell us how to live our lives? So yes, I think there's a bit of uh, hypocrisy and a little bit of glass house living going on here. And I think that's a risk that we all have to be very much aware of. Let me follow up with Alan Rock on that, because uh, we all certainly appreciate the argument that the Amazon is on fire, and therefore there is an urgency to that, that there may not necessarily be elsewhere in the world. But Gary is right. China and the United States are two of the, the worst polluters in the world today. And if they can violate Brazil's sovereignty to deal with this admittedly urgent crisis at the moment, what's to say that other countries can't violate America's or China's or India's sovereignty to deal with the contribution they make to climate change? Don't forget that four years ago, every country in the world agreed on the Paris Accords. Every country agreed to do its part. Uh, that was an international agreement, a multilateral agreement toward a common goal. Um, and the same rules ought to apply to every country, uh, Canada included. Uh, there should not be two classes of, uh, of, of countries when it comes to the obligation to save the planet. But it's a question of degree. And I think it's false to compare the twinning of the Trans Mountain Pipeline uh, to the fires in the Amazon, there are difference in degree which separates those cases completely. 
Uh, as to pollution in India and China, yes. Uh, the differential rates of development and their contribution to pollution was uh, discussed and debated at the time the Paris Accords were uh, agreed upon, and they're expected to do their part. And I dare say that if, if, um, if China or India was doing something that had the degree of impact that is potential with the Amazon destruction, uh, I'd be making the same argument. Now, in terms of real politic, we know that um, there are going to be different rules for the United States and the other members of the P5. Uh, look at R2P. Uh, no one's going to enforce uh, responsibility to protect in Chechnya, for example, if, um, if Russia engages in uh, violence against uh, its citizens there, because they're a member of the Security Council on a permanent seat with the, with the veto right. So in real politic, we know the U.S. and France and, and Russia and China are not going to be the subject of a Security Council resolution. But that doesn't change the point of principle, that where we can effectively act as a global community, we should, uh, to, to stand against governments that are flouting uh, these important requirements uh, to keep the temperature down and to uh, slow climate change and to put adaptive measures in place. And uh, that applies to Canada and uh, every other country in the world. Can I just jump in there? I, Please. I, I would just say that, uh, you know, if Brazil's uh, actions uh, on, on fighting fires uh, are, are causing a great deal of, of pollution, I would say China's building of coal-fired power plants at the rate that they're building them. And uh, sometimes we don't have a lot of independent verification of China's environmental plans and policies. I would say that's much worse than what's happening in the Amazon. Having said that, we're also told China's among the world leaders in alternative uh, energy uh, development as well. So th mm -hmm. they at least, at least they seem to on the surface be understanding that the days of building coal fire plants uh, ad infinitum are coming to an end. Fair to say, Gary? Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm skeptical of uh, s some of the things that come out of the Chinese leadership. They can talk a good game, but uh, if we don't have actual uh, regular independent verification, co color me skeptical. Okay, we can do that. Um, Teresa, let me go to you on this. Uh, Alan Rock's uh, position notwithstanding, or I should say the criticism to Alan Rock's position notwithstanding, do you see this... Um, I mean, are we at, a, at an inflection point in the world right now where the fires in the Amazon and the world's attempt to get some kind of reaction to it, whether it's as dramatic as R2P or something else, is it an inflection point? Is this a turning point in the way that the world views environmental degradation? I hope so, but I have um, I'm, I'm I'm so pessimistic because I see inflection points all the time. I see the um, you know a report on mass extinctions and as a, as a as an inflection point, a report on twelve years left to save the world as an inflection point. Um, I think that uh, you know until we get serious about structural change, we're not going to have events trigger large um, multilateral action. I just don't I don't see it. And you're right in saying, Steve, that the fire is burning now, and so it's capturing the world attention right now. Um, I think that the problems that we have are much more structural and, cons and, and, and they're, they don't respond to just an event. Hmm. Simon, I guess I should ask you to confirm something that we have been saying. I know I said it in the introduction of this segment, and, uh, you know, we hear it all the time, but I want to know if it's actually true. The Amazon, as quote unquote, the lungs of the planet, is that in fact the case? Uh, it's one of the major rainforests, the Central African one being the, the other one. And yes, those forests do suck quite a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere on a, on a, on a, uh, on a daily basis. Um, so in that sense, they are one of the major ecological phenomena which we really do need to try and maintain intact. They obviously have local effects in terms of deforestation, um, changing the evaporation patterns from the local ecologies. And indeed, that may be one of the reasons why some Brazilian cities are having problems with water over the last decade or so in terms of rainfall patterns getting messed up. So there's local effects um, as well as, as, as global effects. And if the Amazon to were to, to disappear, to... sorry, Simon, just one quick follow-up. If in fact the Amazon were to disappear because it's just been burned out, what would the impact on the planet be? 
And that would be dramatic and, and probably irreversible. It's one of the major ecological systems that we have to maintain intact if we're going to keep the climate system in something approximating what humans have known through history. Um, it really is that big, which is why the international attention to this issue is, is justified and Alan's concern is, is, is shared widely. Um, just to, I, I think that the, the point that we do need to keep circling back to on the sovereignty issue, of course, is that while the international community may have agreed in Paris in 2015 that we collectively have to do something about it, it is worth reminding people that the mechanisms for doing something about it reverted back to states. The key mechanism is supposed to be nationally determined contributions, emphasis there on the nationally. Um, so we have sort of reinstated sovereignty as the um, uh, mechanism within which this uh, issue will be, will be tackled. Interestingly, Bolsonaro was talking about withdrawing Brazil from the Paris Agreement a while back, um, precisely because he understood that, in fact, the international community uh, might call him out on his failure to live up to um, the promise to get serious about this. Um, so we do still face the world with the architecture, as Teresa says, that really isn't well designed to deal, to deal with this issue. But in terms of international comparisons, we also don't do, um, do it well in terms of the crucial point about individual per capita, um, as they say, uh, uh, use of, of fossil fuels. And at that, if you had that graph, um, it would put Canada right up at the top of the list which is why the argument about having multinational, multilateral um, pressure put on the worst offenders, um, well, the international system really should be putting a whole lot of pressure um, on Canada because despite what measures we have been taking uh, very modestly over the last few years, uh, we need to think much more comprehensively about how we change our economy so we use an awful lot less fossil fuels and do so quickly. Um, and I think that uh, certainly it seems, uh, to your point about inflection points, that um, there's been a bit of a sea change in public opinion um, in the last year, and particularly the um, high-profile um, activism of, of Greta Thunberg and her high school striking colleagues. I do think that that's beginning to change the public um, discourse. The crucial point is, can we maintain that uh, in the medium and long term? Uh, and turn that into actions which make us realize we can't go on burning stuff, whether it's fossil fuels or logs um, and trees in Brazil, um, if we want to have a habitable planet in the long term. And that is really the crucial question, and we need to face up to it. The architecture that Teresa wants to deal with more structural change is something that's long overdue um, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the planetary system, and hopefully, um, the Trumps and the Brexits and the Bolsonaro's um, insistence on sort of nationalist sovereignty arguments. Hopefully this is the last um, kick of a dying breed of politician um, because we do need to move them aside um, because this is not the kind of politics we need if we're concerned uh, about having a habitable planet for the, for the long term. In our last five minutes and change to go here, let me just put one more issue on the table for your discussion. And uh, to set it up, I want to quote Franklin Four, writing in The Atlantic magazine, who says, if there were a functioning global community, it would be wrestling with how to more aggressively save the Amazon and acknowledging that the battle against climate change demands not only new international cooperation, but perhaps the weakening of traditional concepts of the nation state. The case for territorial incursion in the Amazon is far stronger than the justifications for most war. In the meantime, the planet chokes on old notions of sovereignty. I should ask the former president of uh, the University of Ottawa, who's still teaching law, and a former politician as well. Okay, Alan Rock, our notions of sovereignty, do we need, uh, do we need to change them? Yes, uh, that was music to my ears. I look forward to reading that article. The fact is, I think we are at an inflection point. And I think what we need more than anything else is leadership. And I see we, we see a form of leadership to that 16-year-old girl who came across the ocean, uh, Greta Thunberg, in, in the sailboat, and is inspiring people to speak out and to act. We saw leadership at the G7, where Prime Minister, uh, President Macron uh, spoke forcefully and pulled the consensus together, except, of course, for you-know-who, uh, to speak 
out about the fires in the Amazon. And Canada should be contributing to that leadership. We are in many ways, but I think more can and should be done. And so I think the inflection point this time might be different if we have leadership and a clear vision and a strong, rational argument for why 19th century sovereignty has to be set aside to deal with a 21st century challenge that cannot be met if we allow every state to make its own decision as to whether it's going to contribute. And Simon's point about the national responsibility is an important one. It makes it an exact parallel to R2P, which says, we all agree there shouldn't be genocide. Each individual state's required to protect its own population. But if it does not, the international community has a responsibility to take appropriate action. Not necessarily marching across the borders, but sanctions, economic consequences, political pressure. And that's what I argue should be taken by the, the global collective, the, the international community, standing up for the globe, standing up for the planet. Let me uh, follow up on that with Gary and then Teresa to comment on whether or not you see any other ways of coercing, if that's the right word, coercing states to protect the environment that so far have not been utilized. Look, on, on my front, uh, I think uh, it's nice to talk about these so-called outdated uh, situations of sovereignty, but I think the real politic around it means that uh, we're far, far away from, from getting away from that. Look, uh, re responsibility to protect uh, the Syrian civil war, President Assad is, uh, is still there. Uh, the Rohingya uh, in, in, in Burma, the, uh, nothing as much has changed with the uh, regime there. Look. I think we have to work within the tools that we have. President Macron uh, on this issue uh, has threatened not to sign a, a deal with Mercosur, uh, a free trade deal. So he's clearly using what he believes in is in his national interest uh, to use a tool in his national interest to pressure on the international scale. And I think that using the tools that we do have in real time, multilateralism, and in some cases bilateral relations, uh, is the way to go to, to force, uh, to pressure on these things. And if we're going to pressure a Brazil and a Bolsonaro, then we should do it in places uh, where, uh, you know, there may be the progressive left that are in favor, like Evo Morales in Bolivia. Can I impose for 30 seconds to respond to part of that, please, Steve? Sure. Twice now, Gary's, Gary's referred twice to the failure of responsibility to protect in Syria and in Myanmar. Listen, it, it, it was never applied in Syria or in Myanmar because there were vetoes at the table, Russia in the case of Syria, China in the case of Myanmar, that prevented any action being taken. The failure to apply the principle of R2P in those countries is not an argument against R2P. That principle remains as valid as ever. It's an argument against the corruption of the Security Council by the vetoes in those hands of those amoral, self-interested countries who stand in the way of action. It's not an argument against R2P. In Syria, there was also a red line that President Obama said that he laid down that he then withdrew. So, uh, you know, that, uh, that was not also helpful in that situation. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to go to Teresa now. And I want to know if there's anything else in your toolkit, Teresa, that we haven't talked about yet that you think might be useful here. Well, I, I, I would echo Simon's um, points on certification, right? And what kind of things do we as um, uh, developed countries consume and uh, through what sorts of accountability mechanisms have they been subjected to in order to know what it is that we are consuming? Um, but I also would say that uh, in terms of multilateralism, the one Amazonian country we haven't been referring to is Ecuador, who in 2007, uh, Rafael Correa, its president, made headlines by announcing the opportunity for the international community to invest into a multilateral fund. Um, uh, Ecuador would forego exploiting 20% of, of its oil reserves that were lying underneath uh, one of the most biodiverse rich areas in the Amazon. And uh, the international community failed at that. Now, there are all sorts of reasons. Perhaps, you know, Rafael Correa, like Bolsonaro, is not trustworthy. But there have, um, you know, there have been opportunities for the multilateral community to act and put its... Um, uh, to, to 
to put the money forward that uh, that Alan Rock's talking about. Um, one one other mechanism that I would um, just raise here is nobody's talking about the stewards of the earth, the resource dependent communities that are actually closest and most affected by what's going on. So we're talking about global biodiversity and global climate change, but there are lives of people who uh, are on the balance as well and who are stewards of the earth, who the international community could work with. You, you know, my colleagues are invoking Greta Thunberg. That's a bottom up approach, right? That's not not multilateralism at work. That is a failure of leadership uh, that she's calling out. So um, there are communities on the ground. I'm not talking about Conservation International, WWF, the big international NGOs, but I'm talking about communities on the ground who could really use some assistance in order to be able to pressure from the inside the Bolsonaro government. I want to thank the four of you for coming on to TVO tonight and providing so much nourishing and useful debate uh, for our viewers. That's what we like to think we do here. Alan Rock and Gary Keller in our nation's capital, Simon Dalby in Waterloo, Ontario, Teresa Cromars all the way over from Madrid, Spain. Thanks so much Thanks. for joining us tonight, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.